Please take your seats. Good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome. Well, a welcome anyway. Some of you haven't even noticed it's a bit chillier in here this morning. You see, that's because, like me, you're, you've got this internal heater that keeps you warm. I don't know whether it's called middle age or what it is, but there we are. Anyway, we do bid you a warm welcome this morning. We do apologize that it's a wee bit chillier in the sanctuary this morning than it normally is. We've had an electrical fault so it's not the problem with the timer or anything like that, but uh, the heating was not on until a wee bit later than it usually would be. However, it means that you can just cuddle up. So you're now looking at the person next to you and thinking, <laughs> do I really want to cuddle up? With? This is a Christian church. We're supposed to be brothers and sisters. Just huddle together as best as best you can. And also, you're very welcome to join us after the service through in the hall for a soup and sweet lunch, the proceeds of which will go to Christian Aid, because this is the beginning of Christian Aid Week. And we hope that you will join us for that. Uh, it's £3 for an adult and one fifty for a youngster. Uh, there's lots of choice of soup and sweet through there, and the soup, at the very least, will warm you up. Thanks so much to all of those who have contributed to making the food that's prepared for the lunch. Um, it looks and it smells great, let me tell you. Uh, last Sunday, we gave an opportunity to have a retiral offering for the Disasters Emergency Fund for Nepal following the terrible earthquake which devastated the communities there. And there's another chance today, just in case you weren't here last week, then you can contribute this morning if you wish to at the end of the service. There are baskets both at the front door and at the rear door as you go through to the hall. But I'm going to hand over to our Boys Brigade Captain now, Colin Weir, because he's going to lead us through some celebration of the achievements of a boys in 2nd and 4th Motherwell Company. It's been a fantastic year. And in particular, Friday night at the Battalion Review was an excellent time for the boys and their officers. Over to Colin. Derek. Morning. Um, so, yeah, as Derek said, it was a fantastic night for us on Friday at the Review this year. Um, we brought back quite a bit of silverware, unfortunately no clothware. However, um, we we done particularly well. The company this year have been working really hard within their competitions, as well as doing all their badge work and all their achievement work, um, which culminated in results for us this year, where we came runners-up in the athletics, runners-up in the physical challenge, uh, joint first in the senior football. We won the squad drill competition, we won the restricted drill competition, and the one that's most important to us, we won the Bible knowledge competition. Now, Derek commented this morning when he was looking at the Bible knowledge shield, that there's eight engrave well, there's nine engravings on them on that, and eight of them say second, fourth Motherwell. So we're delighted with that. And putting all these results together, it meant that we won the runners up cup for the battalion. So we were particularly delighted this year. So well done, guys. <laughs> Just before I move on to doing um, the presentation of some awards for, for four of our boys that are here this morning. Um, one of the things that we're hoping to do, if you remember last year, we aimed to walk, well, we started 125 miles for 2-4 for our 125th anniversary. Then it started raining and snowing and windy and things. So we changed it to 125 kilometers. Um, but sort of following on from that, we are planning uh, in September to take part in a fundraising event for York Hill Hospital, where we're encouraging all the boys, families, and anybody from the church who would like to come and join us. Um, it's a 10K walk round about the streets, I think, in Glasgow, um, to raise money for York Hill, and it's going to be happening in September. So if anyone would like to take part in that, um, it's not hill walking or anything like that, it's just round about the streets, or take part in some of that, then please speak to uh, any of the boys or the officers and give them your name and uh, we'll get in touch with you about that. But that's not until September, so you've got plenty of time to train and get in shape for that, so there's no problem. 
Now this year, we're delighted that we'll have two boys receiving their president's badges. Now to get a president's badge, boys have to be involved in the company for a good number of years, have to gain level four in all of their uh, awards, and also um, attend a training course on building your sort of leadership skills. Now I'm going to ask the two boys to come forward just now to get their certificates, please, from Mr. Hughes. That's Barry Williams and Ian Moore. So first of all, Lance Corporal Barry Williams. Oh, sorry, confused that. And Lance Corporal Ian Moore. I've also got two boys this year, or two young men rather, who are receiving their Queen's badges. The Queen's badge is the highest award within the boys' brigade, and these two young men have worked particularly hard over the past two years to gain this taking part in various community, um, what's the word? Community activities? Community activities, no. Community service awards. <laughs> community service. Um, leadership, with, <laughs> leadership within the company. Over to you. Uh, <laughs> leadership within the company and also uh, various other tasks that have been set out to them uh, throughout the, the past two years. Now, we're absolutely delighted to welcome Sergeant Scott Grant and Sergeant Callum Cahoon to come forward to receive their, uh, their Queen's Badge certificates. to Scott and to Callum. It's fantastic for those of us who see a wee bit of the Boys Brigade over the course of the year just to see these young lads coming through. As Colin said, as he indicated, they are going from being boys to being young men. And there's a huge amount of effort that goes into uh, getting awarded these badges this morning, these awards. If you are free and you're able to come along to the parents' night, then that's going to be on Friday night, and we hope that you can join us for that through in the hall. It'll be a great time when the whole of the company, from the youngest boys and the wee red jumpers, the anchor boys, right through to the oldest, uh, the, those young men at the top of our company and our officers all take part. It's something really to celebrate, as is this, our congratulations to all of the boys and the officers on a fantastic year. And thanks also to many of the parents, some of whom are here this morning, grandparents too, indeed, to offer their support. Without them, nothing of this could be achieved. Psalm 66 says, come and celebrate. Shout joyfully to the Lord your God. Glorify Him with your praise. Come and see what God has done, what awesome things He has accomplished. Let the whole world Bless His holy name, for our lives are in His hands, and He keeps our feet from stumbling. Let's join our hearts and our voices together in praise of our God in our opening hymn number 449 from the church hymnary, Rejoice, the Lord is King.
great and an uplifting hymn to start with. You're in good voice, and that's terrific. Let's now lift our voices in prayer as we draw near to God, for God longs to hear the prayers of His people. Let us pray. Holy and majestic God, we come together in these moments to bring our worship to You. We're a people who would like to think that we love You with all our hearts and souls, with all our might. But there are so many other things in our lives that clamor for attention. We often relegate you to Sundays and to times in between when we feel a deep need for you to come and to rescue us, to scoop us up into your loving and gracious arms. Most of us really do want you to be the one in whom we live and move and have our being. We really do want to hear your voice above all of the other voices in our society. But we admit that we get bogged down in the daily routine. We forget who we are children of the living God, your sons and daughters, set free through faith in Christ. We forget who you are, the creator of all things, the Lord of lords, the King of kings, the one who commands the angelic hosts. We forget what the church is supposed to be, a community which represents in word and action the good news about the Christ who lives and moves among us, a message of pardon and of peace, a message that all are welcome in your sight and in your kingdom because of what Jesus has done. So here we are. We come before you today with all our human foibles, our short attention spans, and we ask that you would make yourself known to us in the deep places of our lives, that you would help us to recognize the presence of the Holy that you would continue to challenge us and comfort us in equal measure, that you would inspire and encourage us, and that you might make us, through the presence and the work of your Holy Spirit, into a people who reflect the glory and the goodness of you, our God. Hear our prayer. It comes from our hearts. And on our lips now together we sum up all that we feel and see and think and want to say as we join in the words which Jesus himself taught his first followers to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. All my hope on God is founded, all my trust He will renew. Our next hymn from the church hymn, number 192.
Over a period of months now, we have been following through on a series which is entitled Essential Jesus. It's named after a book that you can get, which has got readings for every day, a wee bit of commentary on that, and some suggested prayers. And I know that many of you have been following through on that. Today, we come to the end of a mini section uh, within a section. We've been thinking about the teaching of Jesus, although In a sense, next week we continue that because we're starting to look at the parables of Jesus. But this morning we're reading from Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 to 14. So let's hear together God's Word to our hearts today. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when His disciples came up to Him to call His attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things? He asked. Truly I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to Him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in My name claiming, I am the Messiah and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains." Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. And you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Amen. A cheery wee passage of Scripture. We believe in this church in the importance of the Bible. And preaching through the Bible consecutively often leads you to passages that you wouldn't choose to preach on, but there is significance in every word we have in the Bibles that we carry and read. And so it's important that we be informed about the things that Jesus was teaching about. We'll come back to that in just a moment. Before that, we're going to sing one of the more modern songs that we use in our church. O Lord, the clouds are gathering, the fire of judgment burns. Now, don't be caught out in the chorus because there's a wee bit of a kind of division between the men and the women here. The men sing a line and then the women echo that back. And then we join together again for the last line of the chorus. So, watch out for that, will you? Let's sing this together.
It's a tough, challenging song to sing, isn't it? But hey, it's good to learn new ones. Well, some folk think it is. Some folk just want to go on singing the old ones all the time. You can't do that because the old ones were once the new ones for the church. And anyway, I chose it because it really goes right to the heart of what Jesus is saying in this passage to us this morning. Three days have now passed since the UK general election. Our media, both the print and digital media, are still absolutely buzzing with the news. It was, as we know, an historic high for the SNP. Now, I don't want any booing or cheering during this part of the sermon, all right? It was a lamentable low for the Labour Party, particularly in Scotland, and it signed a return to government by the Conservatives for a further five years. To some, it probably feels like stepping right into the promised land, but for others, it seems like the end is nigh. It would be sad if in amongst the hubbub of the political machinations that have gone on, if Friday's celebrations for the 70th anniversary of VE Day were overshadowed. And I noticed in the news this morning that in various places across our country, people are preparing to reenact some of the street parties that were held at that time. And it's right that we do that because if it were not for victory in Europe seven decades ago, then you and I might not enjoy the democratic freedom that we've had just in this past week to vote. And whether the party you voted for got into power or are now in opposition, we had the opportunity to get up off our backsides and to go to a polling station and to put a cross in a box. Were it not for VE Day and what went before that, then we would probably not be in that position. Throughout World War II, women and men willingly gave their lives to make sure that seeds of hope were planted in the hearts of future generations of people in Western Europe. Often when I'm out in the car, I listen to the radio as I'm going from house to house where I'm visiting people And through the past week, in amongst the political posturing of some rather pampered people, I've heard some pretty emotional stories of what the end of war meant to those who were alive at the time. And there are some folk here today who remember well VE Day. There was one elderly lady, and I have to say, I was really quite moved as I heard her tell the story. She spoke about how she will never forget every light being switched on in the city where she lived on VE Day. Because for the six years that went before that, the community was in darkness because of blackout, because of the danger of bombing. And when she said that that day was her 10th birthday, and she thought that everybody was celebrating that she had got into double figures, I both smiled and felt like crying. A very emotional time. Street parties organized to welcome back returning heroes, while other people waited in vain because their loved one had been lost on a far-flung field. What, you may ask, has the general election of 2015 in the United Kingdom and the celebration of Victory in Europe Day got to do with today's 
passage from the Bible. Everything, actually. Everything. Seismic changes in politics, the rise and fall of nations, wars and rumors of wars are the very essence of what Jesus is speaking about here. These words form the basis of the second longest sermon of Jesus recorded in Holy Scripture. You know what the longest was, don't you? Chapters 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew's Gospel, what's that called? The Sermon on the Mount. And this, chapters 24 that we read, some from today, and chapter 25, which follows, which I encourage you to go away and read this week, are often referred to as the Olivet Discourse. It was delivered on the Mount of Olives, probably around the Wednesday of Holy Week. But this sermon is quite different to the one that Jesus preached in chapters 5, 6, and 7 of the same gospel. While the Sermon on the Mount focuses on the practical reality of how we ought to follow Christ, how we ought to live as Christians here and now every day, the Olivet Discourse in chapters 24 and 25 points disciples to the future in a prophetic manner. Now, ordinarily, we think of prophecy as belonging to the realm of the books of Daniel and Ezekiel and Revelation, the very final book in the Bible. But here we have Jesus taking some time with his closest friends to speak about events which will occur as we lead up to the end of time. Jesus left the temple, we're told in verse 1, and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things, he asked? Truly, I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. That prophecy was fulfilled just over three decades later in A.D. 70 when the Roman armies invaded Jerusalem and they quite literally destroyed the city, setting fire to the temple so that we're told the gold melted and ran down between the stones that had fallen to the ground. The first part of Jesus' prophecy came true in a very short space of time. What about the rest? His disciples asked for guidance as to the timing of all of this, and they asked for signposts. Despite what people have claimed down through the generations about timing, Jesus gave no clear indication of a day or a date or a year when he would return again and the end would come. But he did speak extensively about things that would occur before the end, signs. So although we don't have the timing of the signs, we have the signs of the times. And I want to go through these with you just very, very briefly this morning. I encourage you to look at this passage yourself, because this is a perfect example of what someone said in the past, that we ought to have our Bible in one hand and our newspaper in the other. Although these days, it probably would be your iPad in the other. But the same is true. We ought to interpret what's happening in our news through the lens of what we understand Scripture to say. So Jesus says there would be six signs. Deception, conflict, disasters, persecution, unbelief, and evangelization. In verses 4 and 5, he says, Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah, and will deceive many. How many of you remember from 1978, Jim Jones, in a place called the People's Temple in Guyana, having such a messianic effect that 900 people entered into a suicide pact and died on the same day. A wee bit further on in 1993, 80 lives were lost in Waco, Texas, the United States, because a man called David Koresh 
led astray a group of people called the Branch Davidians who thought that he was the Messiah, Christ having returned. Some of you will maybe have poked fun at a man called David Icke, a former sports presenter who turned self-styled saviour. All of these are examples of how spiritually gullible people can be easily deceived. And Jesus predicted it would happen. These are all part of the prophecy. So how do we know when He really returns? Check your Bible. If you know the Word of God, then you will know for sure when Jesus returns. And let me tell you, there will be no mistaking that it's Him. Deceit leads on to conflict in verses 6 and 7. Jesus said, you will hear wars and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you're not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Korea, Vietnam, the Somme, the Battle of Britain, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, Rwanda, Cambodia, Chechnya, Serbia, Kosovo, the Falkland Islands, Iraq, Lebanon, Israel, Gaza, Afghanistan. Where next? Our world is ravaged. Not just every century, but so often by conflict, by wars and rumors of wars. Jesus was right. Disasters. The second half of verse 7 and into verse 8 says, There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. 2004 now, can hardly believe more than 10 years ago, there was a tsunami on Boxing Day which killed a quarter of a million people in Indonesia and Thailand and Sri Lanka. The most recent Volcano eruption was in Chile just a month ago. 4,000 people were evacuated in an area that hadn't blown for 40 years. And then, of course, just in the last couple of weeks, we've heard of the devastating earthquake in Nepal. Now, with seven to 8,000 people having lost their lives, and hundreds of thousands of people displaced from their homes. Disasters. The beginning of birth pains. Persecution, verse 9 tells us, Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. You will be hated by all nations because of me. Last year, each Sunday, we devoted the prayers of intercession to praying for the church in different countries around the world where Christians are persecuted, they're flung in jail, they're executed just simply because they want to do what we do every Sunday and worship God through Jesus Christ. North Korea, Somalia, Nigeria, Boko Haram, Syria, Iraq, Pakistan, ISIS, ISIL, IS, what are they called? I'll tell you what they ought to be called. Brutal. Unforgiving. Who do they persecute? Who do they target? Christians. People like you and me. And that's why it's come to the point that even Prince Charles and David Cameron have spoken out recently about their concerns as to the way in which Christian communities are being treated around the world. Was Jesus right in His prophecy all these years ago? Of course He was. He knew that it was never going to be easy to be a follower of His, that in this world we would have trouble. But these are only four of six signs. The fifth and the sixth are important also. Verses 10, 11, and 12. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. 
Hands up, who remembers? David Jenkins, the Bishop of Durham in the 1990s in the Church of England, telling us that the virgin birth was not a doctrine that we needed to hold to in the Christian church. It's not that important. You don't need to believe those kind of things in the 20th or 21st century. Stuart Townend, one of my favorite hymn writers of the present age, has had pressure put upon him by the Presbyterian Church of the USA to change one of the verses of a hymn that we sing often here, In Christ Alone My Hope Is Found. What do they object to? They object to the fact that it speaks about the wrath of God being satisfied through the cross of Christ. They want to change it to the love of God. Well, it's both about the love of God and the wrath of God. Stuart Townend, God bless him, has refused to give way on that. Membership in the Church of Scotland is now below 400,000 people for the first time. It has fallen, we were being told, in our Hamilton Presbytery meeting just the other night, in the past 10 years, by 40%. Was Jesus right when he predicted that there would come a time when the world and the church would experience the depths of unbelief? Yes, he was. And Paul to the young Timothy in his second letter, chapter 3, predicted this also. He said that a time will come when people will be lovers of pleasure instead of lovers of God. The sixth sign is incredibly important. Verse 14 tells us this. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come. You see those last few words, they're really significant. And then the end will come. When? When the gospel of the kingdom has been preached to the whole world as a testimony to all nations. In some ways, this might seem like a a really odd sign. There are more than seven billion souls now live on this planet. Amongst that, there are something like 16,000 people groups, distinct people groups in our world. Do you know how many of them have not been reached by the gospel? How many of them have never even heard about Jesus Christ? Six and a half thousand. Six and a half thousand out of more than 16,000 people groups have still not been reached with the gospel. Many of them don't even have a Bible in their own language. If you Google the Joshua Project, then you'll see a website that's really helpful there, and it tells you that we're about 40% short of that objective of the whole world being covered with the gospel of the kingdom of God. And yet there is hope, because for the first time we live in the digital age where through the digital media that we use in this church to live stream our services every week through satellite TV, we are in a better position to share Christ's message with the whole planet than ever we have been before. I titled today's sermon, The End is Nigh. I had lots of images prepared to illustrate it, and I'm afraid my images haven't worked this morning. But you know, I'm not that concerned about that, because I think that the picture that Jesus paints for us in this amazing start to the Olivet Discourse, this sermon in chapters 24 and 25 of Matthew, is a very vivid picture. But we ought to remember this, just in conclusion. We ought to remember that there's a couple of levels on which Jesus' sermon to us works. First of all, there's an element of which that all of these things, other than the last one, other than the evangelization of the whole world, all of the first five, in a sense, happen in every generation, don't they? But the second bit that I want to take from this, and the second bit 
that I want to emphasize is that all of these signs that Jesus describes are a bit like birth pains. That's how he himself spoke about them. Labor contractions. Now, this is where I go into the mode that I can only tell you about what people have told me rather than necessarily tell you about what I've experienced. And I'm before you to hold my hand up and say, I thank God for that. Because somebody once said to me, they don't call it labor for nothing, Derek. It's hard work. And those women here who have been blessed to bring children into the world, I'm sure will echo that. Labor pains. How does it work? Contractions. They increase in ferocity and in velocity as you near the conclusion of the birth of the child. And it's the same with these signs. Rather than focus too much attention and waste too much energy worrying about the what, the when, the where, the how, perhaps we ought to be thankful that there will be an end That Jesus will come again. Because that's what he promised. And that every city will be flooded with light. There will be a party to beat all street parties. How will we know when that is near? We will know because of the birth pains. That all of these things that Jesus spoke about in his sermon in Matthew chapter 24 and 25 will increase. So I'm really sorry. I would love to say to you that the world is going to become a more peaceful place. A place where people coexist and love each other in a deeper way. But I don't believe that that's what Jesus teaches in his sermon here. I believe that he acknowledges that things will get worse before they get better. And they will only get better when He comes. I remind you that history is really His story. And irrespective of who forms a government in Brussels or London or Edinburgh, in Baghdad and Washington and Pyongyang and Islamabad, we can know this. He is on the throne. God Almighty is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. He is the one we worship today. Amen. Let us pray. We are grateful, Lord, for the assurance of pardon which is ours through the cross of Christ. We thank you for overturning the most wicked deed ever in history, and using it for your good purposes. Now bring in your kingdom, we pray, through the coming again of your Son. But before that great and glorious day, help us as your followers urgently to share the message with all we meet, a message of love and of forgiveness, so that they might also share in that party when all things come to their proper consummation in Christ. In His name we pray. Amen. And now we continue our worship as we bring our morning offerings for the Lord's work.
Good morning, everyone. As we continue in our worship today, we are now going to give thanks for the offering that's been received and dedicate it to God's work here in this congregation. And then we're going to pray for our world. And in our prayers for others today, we'll be remembering the uh, recent election, the celebrations of VE Day. But also we'll be praying for Christian Aid, because it's Christian Aid Week this week, and also Mental Health Awareness Week. So just to give you an idea of what we're praying for today. So let's gather our hearts and thoughts together before God, and let's pray to Him. Lord God, we give thanks for all with which you bless us. We are grateful that compared to so many, we have so much. So as a way of recognizing all that you have given us, and as a way of us trying to give something, however small, back to you, we commit our offering to you for your service. Bless all that has been received this day, and guide those who make decisions as to how it is used. Let it be given over for the spread of your gospel in the community served by this congregation. Lord God, in our prayers for others this day, we begin by thinking about the recent political changes which have taken place in our country. Some are celebrating, Lord. Others are despairing. We commit all to you, knowing that you care for both victor and loser. We pray for our new government. Scripture teaches us, Lord, that there is no authority except that which you have established. And so we ask, Lord, that you would give wisdom to those who govern us. Let their values and decisions be guided by what you will for our country and our world. We pray, Lord God, for ourselves as your people. In our following of those who hold authority over us, may our Christian witness be both obvious and sincere. Help us, Lord God, to never get so caught up in politics that we forget who we are. We are Christians, followers of the Lord Jesus, called to display his love, forgiveness, and grace to a world which desperately needs those things. Lord, we celebrate this weekend the 70th anniversary of Victory in Europe Day, the 70th anniversary of the ceasing of hostilities in Europe, bringing an end to World War II. We are thankful, Lord, for the peace celebrated this day. But we also remember the cost. Lord, so many gave their lives to ensure values like freedom and peace were protected. And so we thank you for those who died and whose sacrifice ensure our freedom today. Despite the celebration of peace, Lord, our world remains torn by conflict. Atrocities are committed on a daily basis which make a mockery of both freedom and peace. Lord God, only you can truly bring freedom and peace, and so we pray that you would move powerfully in our world, that the message of the gospel would bring peace to those who need it, and freedom to those who are oppressed. We pray for Christ's return, because only then will hostility truly cease. Sustain us and help us persevere until that day, Lord God. We also celebrate the 70th anniversary of Christian aid at this time. Thank you for this organization which bears the name of Christ and works practically in our world to make the gospel felt. Not only do they stand for the forgiveness and grace of God found in Christ, but they also make this felt by reaching out to those most in need. Thank you for such an organization and the support that we as your church can offer them. We pray that they would continue be enabled to be enabled to minister to our broken world, especially during this Christian Aid Week. And finally, Lord, we pray for another week ahead, Mental Health Awareness Week. In our culture, mental health continues to have a certain stigma, and this is not right. Mental health issues are nothing to be ashamed of, 
They are yet another sign of the brokenness of our world and need as much healing as do more tangible problems. We pray, Lord, that this week would help to educate people and to help people better understand how to approach mental health problems. Lord, we pray that during this week, we as your church may be encouraged to reflect on how we as Christians can help support those who suffer from mental health problems. And finally, Lord, we pray for those whom we know who suffer from such issues, that they may know your peace and your healing hand at this time. Heavenly Father, we lift these and all our prayers before you now, whether spoken aloud or prayed from the depths of our hearts. And we pray them in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and through the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. We now welcome the children who are going to tell us a wee bit about what they have been learning this Sunday. Well, uh, a very, a, a slightly warmer good morning, well, good afternoon to those of you who have just joined us. Welcome. My, my, you look as though you've been busy this morning, boys and girls. Have you been busy in Sunday school? Yes, good. I'm glad to hear it. We wouldn't you like to think you're skiving up there while we're down here in the sanctuary. Tell me, last week we were hearing a wee bit about Abraham and Sarah. And I understand that you've been continuing to hear about their story. And there's maybe a few new characters that you've been introduced to this week. Do any of you know the names of the new characters in your story? They both begin with the letter I. If that's a clue, we'll head up to some of the older folks and see, well, older children. What's the name of one of the new characters? Isaac. Isaac. That's right. And who was Isaac? Um, Sarah and Abraham's son. That's absolutely right. You remember last week God made a promise to Abraham and Sarah. He said, I'm going to bless you with a son. And then Isaac came along. But I suspect he wasn't the first child that Abraham had, was he? There's another character who came before Isaac and his name began with an I as well. Do you know the name of the other boy in the story? Ishmael. Ishmael. Can you tell us a wee bit about Ishmael? Yeah. <coughs> yep, clear your throat. <coughs> right. he, he was the, I'll sit down. Okay. He was the son of Abraham and Hagar, mm -hmm. Sarah's servant girl. That's right. right. But he was destined to turn against all his brothers. Absolutely. Excellent answer. Somebody was paying attention. Excellent. Absolutely right. Ishmael was the son of Sarah's maidservant, Hagar. And I think, well, as we know, it didn't quite turn out very well, did it? Because Abraham was supposed to do as God said, but he didn't, and it kind of ended quite badly. 
And that got me thinking about times when we do as God says and sometimes don't do as God says. So we're going to do a wee experiment this morning. Um, and, and before we do, I'll, I'll explain to you in a minute what we're going to do, okay? But Derek, um, could, you step out of the, could you step out of the sanctuary for a moment, please? Just... <laughs> It's, fine. it's just so I can have well, a chat you're not going to do children. anything shady. No, absolutely not. No, 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 These no. Boys and girls are precious to me, you know. I, I know. I Treat know them that. well. I will. Just okay, right? They'll okay. be fine. Don't worry. Don't worry. <laughs> Go. First time for everything. <laughs> okay. Now that he's gone, what's going to happen is Derek's going to come back in and he's going to tell you to do three things: stand up where you're at, turn around, and sit down. But I don't want you to do as he tells you, okay? Shh, shh, don't give the game away, okay? So he's going to come back in. He's going to tell you to do it. I don't want you to do it, and I just want you to keep quiet, okay? Can you do that for me? Okay, I'll, I'll get him back in. Derek! Derek, are you there? Can you, can you come back in? So I was having a great time there. <laughs> I was speaking to Martin. Is it warm in the corridor? Yeah, there the See, that's the warmest part of the building, that <laughs> corridor, by the way. It's lovely. So, I understand you're going to ask the children to do yes, something. Definitely, okay. because these boys and girls always do what I tell them. Right, you ready, boys and girls? Stand up! <laughs> that was a bit half-hearted, Adam. So my grandson always does what I tell him. <laughs> Turn around! Well, I was going to tell you to sit down, but you're already sitting down. Oh dear. It doesn't look what have like you done to my boys and girls? Well, it looks like they've not done as they were told. How does that make you feel, Derek? Rubbish. Does it? That's, I'm really disappointed to hear that. Tell you what, why don't you go back out and I'll have a wee word with them, okay? See if we can sort this out, okay? Now don't, don't, don't The worry. student takes over. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gone, gone, gone. That was brilliant. You did really, really well. Okay, we're going to try it again. Derek will come back in. We'll do the same thing. This time, I do want you to stand up, and I do want you to sit down, but don't turn around, okay? <laughs> so we're going to do some of what Derek says, but not all of it, okay? Can you do that for me? So we will stand up and we will sit down, but when he says turn around, just you stand where you are, okay? And we'll, we'll see how he feels then. So, Derek! Derek! Yes? I've had a wee word with them. Good, good. And, and, and good. we'll see what happens this time, okay? No problem at all. We'll, we'll try this again. Right, stand up! <gasps> yeah, beauty! <laughs> Turn around! Wait a cotton picking moment. Sit down! Well, that was better. They Hi! did some of what you said. How do you feel now? They did some of it, but not all of it. I feel kind of absolutely average. Absolutely average, okay. Well, listen, I'll have another wee word with them because it seemed to work the first time. So if you, 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 you take a minute to step out again, I'll have one the last divine word Stuart with them. Love. What can I say? The divine Stuart Love. A word from the student. <laughs> you are all doing fantastically this morning. This time... We'll bring Derek in and we'll put him out of his misery, won't we? We'll do everything that he says to make him feel a lot better. Can you do that for me this time? Okay, that's fine. Derek! Derek! Yep. <laughs> we'll try this one more time. Right. Better hurry up because folk need to get a bus, you know. Right, stand up! <laughs> Turn around. Sit down. Yes! <laughs> Goal. How do you feel now? I feel great. Great. Excellent. Boys and girls that do what they're told, fantastic. There you go. And you know, that, that's in some ways what it's like with God. When we didn't do as Derek said, he felt sad, he felt disappointed. But when we did do it, he was, he, well, you saw how happy he was. It's the same with God. When we don't do as he says, he's disappointed. When we do it, he's happy. But you know, there's one other thing with God. When we do things wrong... If we say sorry to God, he forgives us. And that means I've got a bit of a confession to make this morning. 
Well, it's not then that's to say sorry. No, because you see, it was, it's not their fault they didn't do as you said, because I told them not to do it. So Shocker, it's actually my Rooney. fault. So that's my confession, and I'm really sorry, Derek, for, for doing that to you. Can you forgive me for it? Yes. <laughs> You're forgiven. Thank you very Pardoned. much. And that's what it's like with God. Just as I said sorry to Derek and he forgave me so we can say sorry to God, he'll forgive us. And after he's forgiven us, don't do what Abraham did, which was to do his own thing instead of God's thing. Try and do it God's way because that makes God really pleased. But even when we don't, we can still say sorry. Let's say a wee prayer and then we'll sing our last hymn. So let's pray. Lord God, thank you that when we say sorry to you, you forgive us. So help us when we do things wrong to say that we are sorry and know that we are forgiven. And then, Lord, once we are forgiven, help us, all of us, to try our best to follow things your way. Not to do what Abraham did and try it his own way, but to focus on you and do it your way. Thank you that you help us to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you again. You were fantastic this morning. Let us conclude our service by standing and singing our last hymn, a right rousing hymn, if I do say so. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. May you play your part in preaching the gospel to the whole world.
that they may come to know Christ as their Lord and Savior. May you experience his blessing upon you and his presence with you as you leave this place now and forevermore.